questions related to lab six? Doctor, I have a question about the midterm. Yes. Uh, you, you sent us the adjusted grades by email, but uh, on Blackboard, I still can't see the grade for the midterm. Yeah. I don't want you uh, to focus on Blackboard because whatever is on Bra Blackboard is not the official one. So I sent you an email and the email will not show here, right? Yeah, I need to go into my sent email. Yes, the email I sent you is the one, is the only reference, okay? So whatever you have here is basically scratch paper. So it's not gonna be your official grade. Thank you, doctor. Yeah, but how come it doesn't show? Let me see. So probably I went through it without clicking save. Yeah, but who cares? But yeah, you, you would like to know, as I can see, you wanted to know eventually your actual grade. So who's talking to me again? Is it Anna? Uh, yes, doctor. I saw my grade by email. Uh, I received the email, but I didn't uh, see the grade on Blackboard. That's why I was asking. Yeah, so on Blackboard, it shows 120. It doesn't show at you. 120 out of 200 without the raise, it's random. So it means nothing. But this also doesn't show. I will check again. Yeah. But I know for a fact that it didn't show initially. But eventually, when I click uh, save or something, it should show. Anyway, even if it doesn't show, it means nothing. But I wanted you to see everything just for things to be transparent. All right, I can see that Karen just joined us. Hello, Karen. All right, so yeah. Hello. Hello. Any other question before we start lab seven? You will be surprised. Lab seven and eight are very easy material, some of which could be confusing though. So that's why I want to go slowly over all the procedures. I assume your silence means no uh, question so far. So that's the outline for lab seven. You have four mini experiments to cover. Reflection, Snell's law, which is refraction, dispersion, and I mean by dispersion, when you have white light through a prism, it's gonna show you many colors. Also easy material. Total internal reflection could be tricky a bit. By the way, when I do reflection, it's gonna be on a flat and on a cylindrical mirror. I know that probably covered uh, most, uh, you, you, you basically know what reflection on a flat mirror is. For cylindrical mirror, most of you did not cover that unless you started the reflection in the course. Did you start the reflection in the course? Perfect, so you know more than what I needed you to know because I only need you to know the definition. If I go to lab eight, the outline is gonna be experiment one, two, three, or if you wanna call them uh, uh, five, six, seven, these are also mini experiments. We're gonna play around with con convex and concave lenses. Usually I call them, uh, what do I call them? Convex and concave. Your teacher is gonna call them, uh, I totally forgot. So basically they have different names. I will show you, yes, converging and diverging lenses. Thank you, Yara. So. Basically, in your high school, you, you used to call them converging and diverging. However, in the course, I think now in the course, uh, they're going to be called convex and concave. And this could be some confusion to some of you. How about you, we call them anything you want? And every time I show you how they look like, the symbol, so we can uh, relate. The lens maker equation, I believe, is very important experimentally and for the MCAT. So you know you should know what it is and how to use it. Apparent depth is basically how to find the index of refraction of a certain material using uh, uh, some techniques, all right? That I believe could be interesting in your experimental uh, growth, but uh, probably not gonna be used in the course. And by experimental skills, you learn what you need to apply for the MCAT. Anyway, so we have seven items to cover. I'm gonna start with the reflection and I'm probably gonna be quick. Uh, we'll remove the number of participants. We'll fix my screen a bit. So please stop me if you believe there's something not clear. Let me put those smaller a bit. All right, so basically you have a light source. And as you can see here, you have a flat mirror. The light source is gonna send you a single ray. 
and the single gray is gonna get reflected on the mirror and you can, what you will be able to do, you can draw the surface of the mirror, you can draw the incident ray, you can draw the reflected ray. So basically, this is the experimental part you do. Now the theoretical part, you need to know uh, one of the law of reflections, one of the laws of reflections, because you have two laws of reflections, reflection, the incident ray and the reflected ray are in such a way that the angle of reflection and the angle of incidence are equal. How do you measure the angle of reflection and the angle of incidence? You need to draw the normal to this reflecting surface. And you measure the angle with a regular protractor from the normal to the light ray. And yeah, relative to the normal, thank you, Yara, and not relative to the surface. As you can see here in the experimental procedure, you don't have the, the normal yet. So your job is to draw the normal and then measure each. Again, sharing my screen again, sharing my screen again. All right, is the recording still happening? Yes, everything is cool, I think so, yeah. All right. So yes, we were saying uh, the laws of reflection and I was saying that experimentally you're supposed to draw the mirror and then deduce the normal. And you know, by drawing the normal, it's somehow an estimation because it will never be perfectly perpendicular. And with a protractor, you measure the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection. And you're gonna do three trials and answer some questions. You see, the first part is very easy, very quick. How will I share the values with you? I have two options, either give you the pictures of the experiment or find, uh, give you the angles and that's it. I'm gonna think about it, but probably give you the angles because it's not worth it. By the way, the YouTube videos are ready to show. Yeah, so this is uh, the, the right box, the, the, the light ray box. And it, this is the mirror, it has three sides. I'm gonna use the flat side. For the other YouTube video, it's going to show you that the same ray box, you can rotate it. And instead of having one ray, you can create three rays. And I think up to five rays, it's up to the experiment itself. You know, I will be back uh, to it in a moment. So back to our presentation. Yes. The second experiment, or well, I'm still in the part one, but now I'm doing a reflection on a cylindrical mirror. This part of the mirror is curved, you see? This is a concave mirror and this is a convex mirror. What you need to know is the following. You need to know, first of all, that this is spherical. In other words, it's a, it's a sphere and it has a center C. And let me use a pen to show you the center. This is the center of the curvature that is supposed to be a full circle, okay? The focal point is in the middle between C and the surface of the mirror, okay? So F should be in the middle. This is very important. Uh, for the con convex mirror, it's basically the same. You have C, the center of the spherical mirror. Also, you have the focal point, which is in the middle between P, you can call it P, and C. Now, you in the, in the lab, you're gonna take the case where the uh, beam is cylindrical. And by cylindrical beam, I mean five rays parallel to each other parallel to the principal axis, uh, optical axis. So those rays are gonna hit the mirror. They're gonna reflect back to meet at point F. In the case where you have a concave mirror, in the case where you have a convex mirror, the rays are gonna uh, reflect back, emerging as if going out from F because F is behind the mirror, okay? So you have, like you can call it converging reflection. And in this case, you have diverging reflections. Yeah, I know for a fact that in the course, you're gonna take so many rays. For the lab, happily, you're gonna take only one case. And I think your job is to find the focal point. 
So this is very introductory. And supposedly, this is supposed to happen before the course. But you know, at the end of the semester, the course go faster than the lab and we have no choice. So what you need to do to do is the following. You need to find the focal length which do, by doing this procedure. So send a cylindrical beam and find where the rays is, are going to meet. That's the focal point. To find the focal length, you measure the distance between F and P. And you write it here. And you write it here. Yes, it's OK, Genti. You're most welcome. Then how do you find the radius of curvature using a compass? You will be given the shape of the mirror. You will make sure to extrapolate using different methods. And your job is to find the radius. So again, my question for you is the following. If I give you a, an arc of a circle, how do you find the radius R? Can you please hit me with your different methods? And this is an easy question. Any grade nine student or grade eight student could answer it. So I'm not expecting something uh, complex. So the question is, if you have an arc of a circle, how do you find the radius? Here they said using a compass. To be honest, I think that's the most difficult method. And probably we can use other methods as well. L is two pi r. Okay, Guy. So, but you have the length of a piece of an arc. So it's not two pi r, it's two pi r divided by how small the piece is. Complete the circuit using a compass and draw the diameter and divide it by two. Okay, Yara, but you don't know where the center is. So how would you use a compass if you don't know if the center is here or here or here? You can estimate probably. Or do you want to do a trial and error, like keep on trying until it, it fits? I have never tried this before. I believe it's a lot of estimation, but probably it would work. <laughs> so the question is, you have the mirror in front of you. So it's going to give you an arc. And your job is to find the center and to find the center to be able to find the radius. Any other method? <clears throat> I usually ask my students to draw the arc, okay, like to uh, to draw the, 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 the side of the mirror and to move the mirror parallel to itself and keep on drawing parallel to itself, move it a bit like one millimeter keep on drawing until they do the full circle. I know for a fact that by simply uh, moving the mirror parallel to itself, you have some estimation. And that's a source of error, but it's not a big source of error. A lot of students uh, make the arc a bit bigger and create, uh, what do you call it? A, um, a chord and another chord. They take the midpoint of the chord, draw a perpendicular, midpoint, draw a perpendicular, find the center C and then find the radius. I think this method would actually work. But unfortunately, the arc given by the mirror is very, very small. Look at the mirror itself. Where is it in this video? You see the arc of the mirror? It's basically flat. It's not flat, but it's so, it's so short, like you don't see the curvature well. So you need to elongate it a bit by moving the mirror parallel to itself. So you're still estimating this part, you see? Yeah, so your job anyway, I just want to make sure that you understand that your job is to measure the radius directly. So measure the radius for both mirrors. Now, can you find the relationship that radius is twice F? So you find F experimentally, you find R experimentally, and then you know theoretically that R is double F twice F and you're supposed to compare. So repeat, note, Use a ruler to extend, and then eventually, they, oh, this is the relationship. They want you to find the relationship and so on. So as you see, very simple procedure, very basic procedure. Next, now we're doing Snell's law. And Snell's law is refraction, not a reflection. As you go back to high school and probably to the actual course you're taking at the moment, N1 sine theta 1 is called to N2 sine theta 2. You used to call this Descartes law or Snell's law. This is Snell's Descartes law, and this is very needed in MCAT. N1 is the index of refraction of medium one. N2 is the index of refraction of medium two. Uh, and you have the surface of separation. In your case, it's going to be outside, which is air, inside, which is glass, the type of which is unknown. 
So I think you don't know N, your job is to find N. Again, theta one is the angle of incidence, theta two angle of refraction. You need to measure the angle from the normal and not from the surface. What else you need to know? Uh, what is N? N by definition is the ratio between the speed of light in the medium. No, actually it's the ratio between the speed of light in vacuum divided by the speed of light in the medium because N should be greater than one. N is equal to one for vacuum and is equal to 1.000 something for air. So it's basically very close to one. You can estimate uh, that it's equal to one. And for glass, it would be something close to 1.3 or 1.5, I cannot remember. And I'm not supposed to. Actually, Mbala, it's given to you as the theoretical or the nominal value to compare with. So how do you do the experiment? You don't have, uh, you have this piece of glass so you're gonna uh, shine a light. So I'm here, shine light to one surface of the prism. Uh, it's, you don't see what's happening inside, to be honest. So this ray, you cannot see it. You see what's happening outside. So you grab a pencil, you draw the surface of your prism, you draw the incident ray and the emerging ray, and you remove everything. Now, you try to join this point to this point because you're interested in the green ray, it's the refracted ray. Where is the incident ray, the incident angle? This is the angle of incident. And this is not the angle of refraction. The angle of refraction is inside. So you will be given the angle of incidence, the angle of refraction, knowing that the angle, the index of refraction of air is one. So this is assumed. You can calculate the index of refraction of glass, okay? You repeat three trials, but it's not the exact same trial. So you're supposed to modify a bit the angle. So you rotate your prism right and left. We always ask the students to pick big angle of incidence because the bigger the angle, the less the estimation, the less the source of error is. So calculate index of refraction again, refraction again, it's gonna turn out to be basically very close, similar. Find the average, the RMS, and then compare with this one, Just discuss accuracy, comment, list the sources of errors, and so on. All right? And then they want you to compare the angle that leaves the trapezoid. So they want you to compare, uh, let me use orange. They want you to compare this ray to this ray. So what is the angle between these two rays? Some que this question may sound easy or not. Uh, just think about it later on. Uh, I promise uh, it doesn't need a lot of uh, deep analysis. Any question before I move to experiment three? So yeah, this is very introductory and easy. Probably the lab is, mo is, is more enjoyable than the lab report itself. Now what's wrong with dispersion? How about you take a moment to tell me what do, why do you think dispersion happens? I'm sure you have an idea or not, or probably you have a misconception and I'm interested in this part. I'm all ears. So why do you think dispersion happens? Why do you think white light going into a prism will go, will emerge out of it while the different wavelength actually split? Okay, can you please tell me Yara? So I'm, I'm following Yara. In white light, different wavelength for each color. So different refraction angle for each color. So Yara is saying each angle, each uh, a color has a different angle. And my question is, why is that? How come each color has a different angle? How come yellow has an angle? If you go back to Snell's law, it doesn't say that. It says, the index of refraction of the medium is the one that decides upon the angle of refraction. So how come yellow has an angle and red has a different angle and green has a different angle? It's due to what? Anyone has an idea? Probably you took it for granted. You, you knew it existed, but you never, they have different index. How is so? Because lambda in medium one is, is lambda in medium two divided by n. Okay, but lambda will not, okay. So lambda is gonna change in a different medium. Roy, I will get back to you in a moment. So Yara, lambda is gonna change for different media, but I don't see any relationship yet with lambda and theta. 
and it's gonna be the same, you know? So Roy is saying we have different index of refraction. Can you please explain? You can unmute yourself. <coughs> How come different index? You mean like glass has an index of refraction equal to 1.5? <coughs> No problem, Roy. Can you type it? So n is equal to 1.5 for glass. Are you saying this would change? Because this is what I understood from your comment. They have different index. You know, the index is related to the medium. It's not related to light itself. Or am I wrong? I guess Roy is typing. N changes based on the medium. Okay, N is the index of the medium. Roy is saying each color could change N. All right, so what is the thing? The thing is when we say that glass has an index of refraction of 1.5, actually it's different for every color. It is 1.515 for red, 1.517 for yellow, 1.523 for blue and 1.533 for violet. And usually when you, they give you the index of refraction of different media, they do it for yellow. They don't do it for all the colors. So let's say you are in the course and you're solving a problem and your instructor tells you that the index of refraction of this piece of glass is 1.7. It is only for yellow and for different colors, it has to be different a bit. I know it's the index of refraction of the medium but it's not constant to the medium. It depends on the wavelength itself. And that's crazy, I know. Could be confusing for you a bit. That's why each color will feel or will go through a different end. And therefore each color will, give, will be given a different angle. And that's why you will see a tiny difference and white will separate into many colors, okay? So, what colors do you see in what order? The video could help you. Which color is reflect, refracted at the largest angle? Be careful because uh, you need to understand, are they talking about the refraction from outside to inside or inside to outside? So please read the procedure well, follow the video well, read the question again. According to Snell's law, and you know Snell's law, N1 sine I1 equals to N2 sine I2, and you know how N varies with different uh, wavelengths. You're supposed to predict theoretically, violet, is it supposed to refract more or less? So you have an observation, which is the video, what you can see, and you have the theory, which is Snell's law along with the values you have in the table. You can tell a bit if your prediction or your observation and prediction actually match. Without repositioning the light source, turn the wheel to select three primary colors. So this would be done in the video. Watch it very well and try to answer the question. Uh, probably I can show you in the video. I'm not sure though if uh, you can see the different colors, probably those. Let me try. We can rotate the wheel. Is that my hand? <gasps> That's my hand. I thought this is not me. I was going to campus to do the video. I thought the video was done by someone else. I'm so happy. I was feeling so bad sharing with you a video done by someone else. I know my hand because I have a broken finger. I don't know if you ever noticed. Anyway, the purpose of me showing you the video, I wanted to see oh, this. I wanted to show you. Yeah, I wanted to show you the colors. Uh, this, this source of light actually gives you three different colors if you want to. And they want to see if it will ever if it will ever change the order of the color or so on. So it's a very simple question. Just follow the video to see how things are. All right, I'm so much happier now. The video is mine. All right, next, total internal reflection. You need to understand the theory well, and you need to uh, be uh, careful with the experiment itself because it might look a bit confusing. However, it's not. It's only a bit different than the theory. You tell me, please, how do you understand total internal reflection? If anybody can unmute 
himself or herself to explain how you understand it. It's a very easy concept. And sometimes it's overrated with the explanation. Okay. Yara, why don't you unmute yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, so basically for uh, total internal reflection to happen, we need to have N1, uh, which is bigger than N2. And when uh, we have the incident uh, angle that is equal or larger than the critical angle, uh, then the ray would remain reflected within the same medium and it will not go out into the second one. Perfect. And how do you find the critical angle? What is it related to? Um, I think it's related to N1 and N2. Okay. Anybody would so like to add? It. Yeah, it is. It is. Anybody would like to add anything? Okay, so basically uh, Yara started with a condition for total internal reflection to occur, you should have that N1 should be greater than N2, which means ref, uh, uh, the, the, the light ray is traveling from a more refractive medium to a less refractive medium. The angle of refraction is going to be bigger and sometimes it's going to exceed 90 degrees and that's the problem. Uh, and you can see it on your calculator something math error because it cannot work, like refraction cannot occur. So in this case, in all the cases, N1 is greater than N2, but the angle of incidence is still too low, like smaller than the critical angle. So refraction is gonna occur. When the angle of incidence is equal to the critical angle, the light ray is gonna graze the surface. I'm gonna say, this is the refraction happening with an angle equal to 90 degrees. And if you exceed the critical angle, which is the critical angle, you know, you cannot exceed it, uh, refraction will not happen. Total internal reflection is a regular reflection. The, it's called internal because the light ray stays inside the medium. It cannot go outside. And uh, yes, you will have theta one is equal to theta two. And both are greater than the critical angle. Now, how do we calculate the critical angle? The critical angle depends on the medium. And to be honest, it depends on both media, okay? So you simply take this case. So you take this case, you do Snell's law, N1 sine I1 is equal to N2 sine I2. You take the first angle to be equal to theta critical, you take the second angle to be equal to 90 degrees, and you solve for theta critical, and this is what I did here. So you will end up with this equation, sine theta critical is one over N, because N1 in my case was one, and N2, actually N2 is one, because N2 is air, and N1 is water, I'm gonna call it N. Usually, I asked my students to say sine theta critical is small n over big n because obviously sine theta must be less than one. So, or if you don't want to uh, remember any equations, simply start from this one, okay? Yes, so now the issue is how to deal with this in the lab because you have a prism and you know the prism will show you many surfaces. So, this is your incident ray, okay? It's going to continue with a small deviation because the angle of incidence is very close to zero, say a bit, for no reason. But actually, this would give me a very visible ref, uh, internal, uh, total internal reflection. And uh, in the usual case, the incident ray would travel through the glass, and then it's going to go out of the glass. This is the usual case. I will keep my incident ray as a constant. The position of it is constant. And I'm going to rotate the prism a bit. I'm going to keep on rotating the prism a bit. The refracted ray is going to get closer to the surface, and eventually it's going to start grazing the surface. The problem is I will have dispersion, which means each color is going to uh, disappear uh, in, in, in a certain order, which means all, all the colors will not disappear at the same time. So you will be required to make sure all the colors disappear and as soon as the last color disappears, you stop. I'm talking about few fractions of degrees. Whenever everything disappears, you will have the internal reflection. And if I need to, so this is just at the edge. This is the threshold. This is not any theta, any incident. I'm talking about this incident angle of incidence. So for me, this is the incident ray and this is the reflected ray. I'm talking inside. So 
This is N1, the medium, and this is N2, the outside medium. And I'm doing refraction on this surface. You see what I mean? And this could be confusing for a lot of students. So this one is, is called the angle of incidence, and this is the angle of reflection, and we know they're equal. However, what you need to know is that this angle, which is the angle of incidence, is equal to theta critical. Why? Because as soon as the ray disappears, this is where I start doing the measurements. Okay, I'm sure it's gonna be clear in the video somewhere. It should be at the end because in the video, I was taking a lot of measurements. What colors disappear first? Thank you, Ro, Ex excellent question. I was trying my best to avoid answering this question because I want you to watch the video and to answer it yourself. Yeah, but your question is very legit. Anyway, probably while you see the video right now, you can uh, answer the question from simple observation and later on answer the question from a simple calculation. Let me see if the video loads. Here the prism is showing you incident. And the primary colors and let me move the. Okay, so the video is showing you uh, incident ray and refracted ray. I don't want primary colors. I want light ray like, yeah. Probably the experiment was done previously. Okay. Okay, I'm showing you the colors right now. Okay, here, it should be here. Nice experiment. So incident ray, refracted ray, and you can see the colors, probably not. Probably I'm saying them out loud. And as I turn the prism, you can tell which one disappeared and which one not. And you see the faint reflection at some point when all the refracted rays will disappear, the reflection is not gonna be faint anymore. Did I do this experiment previously? I don't think so. I wish, yeah, anyway, I will give you time later on to watch the video, like all of it. All right, I need to tell you something that was experimentally challenging to the students. Aren't we studying everything happening inside the prism? To be honest, the human eye cannot see what's happening inside. So the question is, how do we measure what's happening inside when we cannot see it? What you're supposed to do is the following. You're supposed to draw the prism. You were supposed to draw the incident ray and to find this point. And it's easy to find this point because as soon as those disappear, you would know where the point is. And you have to find to draw this ray. So imagine you drew this ray, this ray, and this point. Now you remove the prism and you simply join with a pencil what's happening inside because you know you need three points and that's it. Once you found, found the three points, you can draw what's inside. And what you have here is two theta critical because it's theta critical plus theta critical, right? Because those are equal. And again, uh, be careful because probably you moved the prism so quickly. So again, for me to start taking measurements, I should make sure all the colors just disappeared and not more because more means I exceeded theta critical. And this could be a source of error. It's a human error because you're rotating the prism and you're supposed to stop as soon as the rays disappear. What if your, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, reaction time is slow? What if you don't see it? What if when you see it, you don't do it well and so on? So that's it for this part of the experiment. And yes, please watch the videos very closely because there's a lot of observation to be, to be able to answer the questions. And these are the questions. They want you to find that the critical experimentally from the basically the previous uh, diagram, this. And then they want you to find it theoretically, and I mean by theoretically following this equation, obviously. And to answer some questions uh, related to the brightness of the reflected ray and related to critical angle for different colors and so on. So, Roy, you're going to enjoy discussing different colors, different index of refraction, different wavelength, and so on. Trust me, it's super easy, and yet it's a bit uh, confusing because you're going to be wondering, am I uh, doing a reflection from the outside to the inside, from the ins like from, from glass to air or air to glass, and this is going to be confusing for you. 
However, if you simply say n1 sine i1 is equal to n2 sine i2, and you keep in mind which is medium one, which is medium two, things are going to be much easier, OK? Just decide, is the reflection happening from one to two or two to one? Like, who is medium one, who is medium two, and you're going to be fine, OK? Any question before we move on to the next experiment, the next set of experiments? And remember, those are not experiments. Those are like mini parts, mini experiments. Yeah? All right. So now convex and concave lenses, and this is really nice and easy. I know for a fact that in the course you cover so much more, and this is only introductory. So you would be given a convex lenses. Let me see if they're visible in the video because you need to know how the lenses look like. Okay, they should be here somewhere. I just want to show you the shape. So you see, it's a cross-sectional section of a lens and you can simply put it on your desk and it's nice to see the behavior of the ray. Those are three rays. Parallel, by the way, did you notice that the rays are not perfectly parallel? And did you notice that they don't actually meet at one point because they're not parallel? Probably instead of finding one intersection, you're gonna find two intersections and you're gonna try to estimate the midpoint. This is a source of error and it's a good way to estimate. Probably I'm explaining here that I have two intersections. By the way, I was taking the video alone with a tripod so you may not be happy with it. That was done in the fall, probably. I can't remember. All right, anyway, now let me go back to the presentation itself. Where is it? This one? Okay, so a cylindrical beam will hit a converging lens. Uh, yeah, so it's the, the rays are gonna converge at the image focus, F prime. And here I have the same beam and the rays are gonna diverge out of the image focus F prime. The image focus for a converging lens is behind the lens. An image focus uh, or the focal point for a diverging lens is in front of the lens. This one will create a converging pattern and this one a diverging pattern. It's very easy in this case to find the focal point. However, in this case, you don't see the focal point. You need to elongate the rays and you know elongating the rays also is a source of error. Um, your job is to find the focal length and remember the focal length, unlike the case in the mirror, you're supposed to measure from the focal point F. In the case of the mirror, you were supposed to measure to the surface of the mirror. In this case, you were supposed to measure from F to the center of the lens. Oh, and trust me, the lens is going to be thick. So you're going to gain so many millimeters inside. OK, be careful with this one. Yes. And same with the uh, diverging lens. And your job is only to write the focal length. That's it. No different trials. And then they want you to nest, nest both convex and concave lens together and see what happens if you nest them as such or if you inverse the order, if they're touching each other or getting away. To be honest, uh, just watch the video. I'm going to do it for you and you can answer the questions. That's it. And this is the question I'm talking about. What happens if you reverse the order? What happens if you put them apart a few centimeters, observe the effect and try to write something about it, okay? Now the lens maker equation. What does it, uh, what does it say? The lens maker equation says the following. Our chi, you need to understand it's an approximated, I would say it's an empirical equation. So it's an experimental equation. It says for you to find the focal length, I'm talking about this focal length that you already measured. The focal length is related to three items. It's related to the type of glass the lens is made of. It's related to radius one and it's related to radius two. Okay, so you're supposed to find N, the index of refraction of the material. You're supposed to find radius one. You're supposed to find the radius two, and you will compare it to F. All right, so uh, they're helping you a bit. They give you the index of refraction of this uh, type of lens. 
And they also saying, telling you that R1 and R2 are the same. They're also telling you that the surface that is concave is gonna have a negative radius. So it's not like you're doing the subtraction, you will end up doing the addition because if we have the same radii, this is gonna be zero. But one of the surfaces is concave, the other one is convex. So one of which would be negative. So you'll end up having a, an addition instead of a subtraction. Uh, now the question, how would you find the radius of curvature? Again, you can do many methods. Method number one, you can simply slide the surface, draw the whole surface, find the radius. Do the same for this one or simply ignore this one and assume they're the same. You can create a chord, another chord, find the midpoint height, find the midpoint height, find the center and then measure the radius. Or you can simply follow the procedure, their procedure and look for a tiny reflection. This surface is a reflective surface. It's not like a mirror. It gives you a partial reflection, but it does give you reflection. And I hope in the video, it's gonna be clear. So you send some rays and those rays are gonna reflect. I'm talking about the reflection and not, I'm not using the lens. I'm just losing the reflective part. If this is the focal length for reflection times two is the radius. All right, so that was very confusing for the students back then. Let me see if it's visible in the video. Here, I'm still taking measurements taking measurements to find the focal length. Am I? No, probably doing the reflection in this case. Let me see. No, I'm still doing the focal uh, point. I want to show you the reflection. I'm elongating the rays. Look, this is ridiculous. They don't meet. And the meeting point is so like those two rays meet at this point and those two rays meet at this point. I repeated the experiment later and they were a bit closer. You see a lot of estimation, but, and I'm gonna share the result eventually. Here I took the midpoint. It's not supposed to be like that. It's supposed that they meet. Okay, now I'm looking for hopefully lens maker equation. This one, yes. Yeah, so don't be confused. Let me say it again. A lens, the light passes through the lens. But do you see this tiny reflection I'm talking about? This is the reflection I'm talking about. So if I tilt the lens just a bit, no, I'm nesting both lenses together. Not yet. Not yet. I want to show you the reflection. Let me see here. I should have this video ready. Okay, here I'm showing you how I'm doing finding the surface, the radius. And I would want to show you the actual reflection. This is radius one, this is radius two. Yellow just see reflection happening now. Okay, did not happen. I missed it. I need to show you, wait, let me find the actual video. Uh, it's gonna be, it's gonna take me forever to find it. Let me give it a final trial, probably here. Read this one, let me. Experiment three has two small. All right, the surface. So you find R1, draw the surface, and you can okay. equation for the lens maker equation, you need the focal length that you already measured, and they want to use the radius of curvature that you're supposed to find. So how do we find the radius of curvature of each surface? We need to draw the surface and draw the surface again and keep on elongating the surface a bit, the surface a bit and find the radius of curvature of this guy and do the same thing for the other surface. So you find R1 and then you do it again, you find R2 and this is the radius curvature uh, you need. 
And from those radii, you find the focal length. And then they want you to compare both values of F. All right. And that's it. Now they want you to do the apparent. Uh, okay. So I skipped this part, obviously, for me not to confuse you. And I think, why not? Since I'm the one giving you the radius, why tell you how to find it? Anyway, back in the past, when we, we used to do, do the experiment in the lab, we used to ask the students to look for the reflection because we believe the reflection is the best estimate for the radius of curvature. So if you can see the refract reflected rays, simply find this length, multiply it by two to find the radius. And this is what I wanted to show you. I skipped this part in the video, obviously, for me not to confuse you. So your job is to find, to compare the focal length that you measured from the first slide to the focal length you calculate from the lens maker equation and is given to you, R1 and R2 will be measured by me and given to you. So that's it. So this equation is important because you're gonna use it later on, okay? Now we have two parts. Experiment three, how to find N. So the purpose is to find N, the index of refraction of anything you have around you using the apparent depth method and the parallax method. So we have two methods, this one and this one, okay? So we have to find apparent depth using the ray tracing method and here apparent depth using the parallax method. Let's say you are somewhere and you're not in a lab, I mean, and you have a piece of glass. It could be, I don't know, a bottle, a cup, and you were wondering what is N, what will you do? I know that both methods are explained in the procedure, but I know for a fact that it could be confusing a bit for you to understand. So what you are required to do for the parallax method is the following. You get a paper, you draw a line on the paper. So you don't need any ray box, just a line on the paper with a pen. You look at the line with your own eyes and you can see it, obviously you're not blind. If you put the trapezoid or the prism or whatever you wanna call it, you will see the line and the image of the line that is inside. The image of the line is gonna look closer to your eyes due to refraction. Like anything, if you have a cup of water and you have a coin inside the cup and the cup is full with water, the, cup, the, the coin will look closer to the surface, right? Same with the image of the line. Then you hold a pencil that is very short and you try to estimate the position of the image. I know this sounds crazy. How can you estimate the position of the image? You know for a fact that the object is on the desk. It's a line that you already drew. And you know for a fact that the image is higher because it looks closer to you. How can you estimate the position of the image? What you can do is you can align the short pen to the image using two eyes, then using your left eye, then using the right eye. The position at which, the position of the short pencil at which the alignment still hold for both eyes is the exact position of the image. And if you ever try it, you will see a huge difference. Let's say you put the pencil anywhere you find an alignment, okay? You try with the right eye, you try with the left eye, the alignment would be broken. It means the position of the pencil is not the actual position. Probably you're gonna uh, find this method ridiculous, but trust me, the estimation is very, very low. In other words, it's a very precise method. By doing so, you can measure the thickness of the trapezoid and then the depth of the image. And by doing the ratio, you can find N. N is actually the thickness divided by the depth. And you can see it in this equation, right? So again, the depth is you can measure with a ruler how deep the image is. And T is how thick the whole thing is. And by doing the ratio, you can find N, okay? That's the parallax method. Parallax means basically it matters where you put your head, where you put your eyes. This is why it's called parallax. And you don't need any ray box. For the ray tracing method, you need a ray box. You need to create two rays. Yes, I will repeat it about the pencil. Yes, Yara, I know for a fact this is confusing. I will get back to it. This one is easier. You need to create two rays intersecting and you need to put a piece of glass 
for refraction to happen. And the intersection, which is this point, is going to move a bit. This is easy. OK? And you can find the thickness and the depth of how far the inter intersection is. OK? So the two rays will actually intersect, but the intersection will move a bit due to the refraction inside the prism. Now, how do you create two rays intersecting? Yani, all this is not supposed to be confusing you. This is only to create two intersecting rays. Yani, if I have two ray box, OK, so how we did it in the lab, we created a cylindrical beam that is made of five rays. Then I put the mirror here as an obstacle. So I would have two rays that are far away from each other. I use the convex lens for them to converge at this point. Now I put my trapezoid at the converging point and the rays are gonna go out, emerge from the trapezoids here. I will elongate to find the intersection. I will discover that the intersection is far away from the actual intersection. And this translation is due to refraction inside the trapezoid, and that's OK. So measure T, which is the whole thickness. Measure the depth, which is the depth from the surface, the base of the trapezoid. Find the ratio to find M. So this one is easy. Now back to this one. Let me say it slowly, because you can do it in any restaurant eventually to find the index of refraction of any uh, glass, uh, anything transparent, actually. So you take a paper, yes, and you draw a line. You look at the line, and you see it, obviously, because you're not blind. You put the trapezoid or any medium transparent on the line. You look through it from above, like I'm looking inside my cup. And you will see the image of the line. You can see if you remove the prism, you see the line. If you put the prism, you see the image of the line. OK, the line goes out of the prism, which means you can see the image inside and the object inside. Again, what I mean by object is the actual thing. The image is what you see through something else. So the image is going to look closer to your eye, obviously, because of refraction. Your job, Yara, is to guess the position of the image. So the image is not on the table. It's a bit higher. So you need a sharp pencil. And you will put your pencil in such a way. So again, I'm looking from above. I feel that the image is closer to my eye. I put the sharp pencil on the position of the image. I know it's an estimation. I look with both eyes to be able to do that. My job is to align the pencil with the image. It should be aligned, Yani. They should create one line. I try to close one eye. You will see the alignment will be broken. Try it now. Try it now. You have your finger on a cup. If you try to look at, look at your finger from different eyes, you can see that your finger will move a bit. It, it doesn't move, but it will look farther or closer to any something, you know? Especially if you're trying to align a pen with an image that is a virtual image, you know? So if your pen is aligned and it is at the same position as the image, the alignment will not be broken if you try with your left eye or with your right eye. So the position at which the alignment holds true for the right eye and the left eye, it means that's the actual position of your image. Yeah, I know it sounds crazy. The only way to be convinced that it's not so crazy is to try. And I don't know how you would be able to try it. I will see if in the video I'm, I'm clear or not. Yes, Yara. So, and this is how I find D and T. And that's it. We're done with the whole thing. Let me have a quick view at the experiment. I would love to see if, so uh, it's without the ray box. I think this one. Yeah. Yeah, and you can see actually, you see the object outside and you see the image, it looks closer to your eye. It looks broken as well. Okay, so yes. And to find a way to locate the position of the image. Is the image at the bottom of the prism or a bit higher? How do I know? I'm supposed to use the parallax method. What is the parallax method? First of all, I estimate where the line is. Then I close one eye and... All right, so do you see that the pen is aligned with the image? 
Kala, it looks so on the lens of my camera. Probably I was seeing something else. I close the other eye without moving my head. Uh, the alignment between my pen, the tip of my pen and the line should not be different. I don't know if you can do that in the, with the video. I'm closing one eye, then another eye, and I can see that the alignment is broken. The pen is no more aligned with the image of the line. So I keep on moving a bit up and down the position of my pen to find the position at which alignment is always there using my right eye or left eye, okay? So if using the right eye and the left eye, the alignment is not broken, you can tell that the position of the image is at whatever point. So you can see here, we have some positions already depicted with the pen. We can easily find T is the thickness. So you measure the whole thing to find the thickness and you measure uh, the distance of, uh, you know, so D is the depth, yeah, not the distance. All right, so that's it. So please um, watch the, the, the video of the experiment very well as you read the procedure and as you answer the questions. As you can see, you don't have a lot of data analysis in this case, no plots, no propagation of error. Probably you need to find the RMS a bit. I don't know if there's one question about propagation of error to find the percentage, uh, the, 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 the uncertainty on N probably once, but that's it. Mostly it's observational and a lot of comparison. Also, for example, when I was in the different, uh, this one, and they ask you to compare those two, those two will be basically the same. You will be surprised, you know? So uh, you cannot do the percentage difference. You can simply say they're basically the same or unless you can see a difference, okay? Yeah, it depends on the measurements. So I hope you enjoy this. You want me to go back to the total internal reflection. Yes, I love this part. This one, yes, Roy, ask me. Figure two, yes. What's wrong with figure two? Is it the critical angle? All right, so basically, I don't know. What I can tell you is the following. If this measurement, uh, so it is basically greater than the critical angle. But remember, Roy, when we did this experiment in the lab, we made sure to stop as soon as the rays disappear. So I will take this measurement whenever I have a very faint red still there, okay? And this is very difficult to do because as you know, the dispersion is gonna happen. So I'm gonna have all the different colors Purple will disappear first if I'm not wrong. And please don't take my word for it because I really cannot remember. And I think red will be the last one to disappear. So Roy, what I can do is the following. I can wait for red to just disappear or make sure I only have red. So for me, that's grazing the surface, but you're totally right. It's like theta critical plus, plus a fraction of an angle or basically theta critical, I don't know. So. The, stu the students, like I will give you measurements, right? And those measurements are given by students. How precise the students were, I don't know. But according to the procedure, it is theta critical only if you start taking measurement as soon as they disappear, because you know when they are visible, this is not 90 degrees. Visible means 89 degrees or a bit more, but not 90 degrees. 90 degrees means you cannot see it anymore. Okay, so how would you locate the angle between 89 and 90 or just at 90 is somehow tricky, you see? But I totally understand your question, Roy, because simply it could be that you rotated your trapezoid a lot and you're beyond theta critical and who knows, all right? That's why you're gonna calculate theta critical using uh, Snell's law and measure theta critical and you can compare how far away they are from each other and you will be surprised they're pretty very close. Okay, I know that the sources of errors are so many and I made sure to discuss them with you during the recorded, the, the, you can see them again in the recorded session, but there are too many, yes, but they don't affect the experiment a lot. You can list like 10 sources of errors, but you will be surprised that experimentally and theoretically, the values are so close because the effect of those errors is not a big effect, 
okay? So if you really think about it, Roy, it's not those so that difficult to just rotate the prism just a bit, especially that your trapezoid is very smooth and your bench is very smooth, the A4 paper is very smooth. So it's so easy to rotate a bit and you will have it, you know? So it's not a big deal. Sounds a big deal though, I know. Yes, thank you for your question, Roy. Any other question? I will put on Blackboard Optics 1 and Optics 2 separately. Why? Because I think it's easier for you. Probably you're going to finish the lab report today, lab report 1, and you want to do lab report 2 in a couple of days. You see what I mean? Separating them will help you set, like divide your work. So why throw everything under one folder if you can do it over many days? So it will be easier for you. However, I'm going to consider those being one lab report, I will grade them separately, yes. I will give you only one deadline and you guys decide how you wanna separate it. So let's say I give you 10 days to finish them. You can decide to do both on one day or to take five days for the first one and five days for the second one, okay? Please divide the work wisely. I know you're not wise in this. I'm not blaming you for that. I know because you're overwhelmed. So that's why usually I break it down for you and what, every time I give you some freedom, I know it's chaos for you. Freedom is not good for you. Any other question? I will stop.